Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening all. Uh, working in tech, the only certainty we have is change. We may know the requirements, the SLAs, etc., of uh, our business applications, but all that changes when, say, you know, company acquisition, a new government regulation comes into play or whatever. Um, the only thing we can be certain is change is constant. Uh, Software Defined gives us the foundation to continuously incorporate this change as it comes along, as we need it, and all without a forklift. Uh, these evolutions are happening more frequently as both hardware and software, which is, if you haven't kept pace with the one-hour updates over the past 18 months, get ready, here comes the blitz. Going to go through a lot of changes that we made over the past 18 months, both from a software side of things and power edge side of things, um, hitting on the highlights only, because otherwise we'd be here for a few hours. But Ray, I know you're going to love some of the charts and you're going to have questions uh, because the charts have numbers on them and it should make it easier to answer them. But please interrupt because uh, this is not about VxRail. This is about uh, our customers and helping educate them. So please uh, ask the hard questions. If I can answer them, Ash or one of the others on the call will be able to. All right. And this is where my clicker doesn't work. So in mid-July, we refreshed our mainstream portfolio with some new nodes based on the 15th generation PowerEdge servers, which utilize the third gen Intel Xeon scalable processor. Lots of hardware changes, uh, faster, bigger, simpler. We could talk about it all afternoon, but I'll only be covering what's most significant change in that portfolio, and that was PCIe Gen 4. More on that in a few, but can't have uh, all these the new, new hardware listed up without some performance claims from marketing. So straight off the bat, uh, with 15G, we are now capable of hitting 155,000 IOPS per host, always under one submillisecond latency. So screaming fast performance. Additional details on more slides, including graphs. So let's uh, plow on. This is accumulation of hardware and software changes that have occurred over the years. So uh, skipping forward, because there's more to come. Uh, VxRail has always enabled customers to start small and expand uh, how and when they need it, be that scaling out with additional nodes or scaling up with additional CPU, memory, storage capacity, or performance. We've always enabled our customers to expand their use case by adding GPUs, fiber channel HPAs, as Don has talked about for the past while, and scaling opportunities continue to grow with dynamic nodes and HCI mesh. In short, change happens. To facilitate change, VxRail permits a lot of choice when it comes to mixing hardware within a cluster. There are only a few, real, few rules to keep everything in balance and a lot of flexibility for cluster and customer, cluster and customer growth. So VxRail, we stand on the shoulder of two giants, PowerEdge servers for hardware, VMware vSphere and vSAN. <clears throat> Both those giants are continuously making changes happen. World-class hardware is not much use without world-class software to unleash its power. As much fun as it will be to look over the changes that have occurred over VxRail lifetime over the past five years or so, time is tight. So let's take a quick look, like, quick look at the highlights and the impact they've had and what we've all gained from that. Starting with uh, storage class memory from Intel Optane it can be used in two modes, um, Optane PMEM. If you have a sh architecture that can make use of the app direct mode, think of a shared nothing style architecture, you can get 12.3 million read IOPS out of uh, using PMEM out of fully equipped node. And that's actually based off the 14G. The 15G results will be higher because there's more memory channels there for, uh, for it. But if you have the right application, the right workload, uh, this is one way to get screaming performance into your environment. Uh, our, the ESG paper there has a lot more details on that. The other way you can use persistent memory is in uh, with memory mode. Uh, this is this enables the um, a larger memory footprint at a lower cost potentially. Now these numbers are from uh, when we released it last year. Uh, since then, there's been a lot of changes in memory prices. Uh, but currently, if you're looking at close to about um, 512 or a little bit above that in terms of uh, memory footprint, uh, going looking towards uh, PMAN is uh, definitely worthwhile doing to see uh, if there's a cost benefit there. So, so David, yes, right. Uh, you don't support Optane as a as an SSD or? Yes, we do. Okay. This is so. Uh, Intel Marketing have used the term Optane to refer to a few different things. Uh, persistent memory is one of them, and we use Optane SSDs as a uh, as the cache layer. Right. Uh, PMEM actually sits in the DIMM slots. Yeah, no, uh, I, I understand. I was just perfect. trying, you mentioned that you, 
it was an exclusive to Pima, but I got you. I understand. Perfect. Um, yes, opt-in for a cache drive is a very nice option. So speaking of cache drives, thank you, Ray. That was a wonderful segue. Um, when I joined VxRail two years ago, we talked about NVMe cache drives as a, a future-proofing technology because at the time, the performance delta between a, a SAS cache drive and an NVMe cache drive was minimal. Uh, then 7.0 hit the scene and unlocked the value of uh, NVMe cache drives. Uh, as you can see here, we kind of split the, the, the groupings of these different configurations. These are just a whole lot of different uh, drive capacity and um, cache tier configurations. You can see the two bottom ones are the cache tier configuration and the, the performance that is gained by just having NVMe in that cache tier. Uh, given the overall cost of a, a node, a VxRail node, uh, the incremental cost of having a cache tier, an NVMe cache tier, is um, minimal for the extreme performance gain that it brings. There's a lot going on in this slide. Uh, I mentioned earlier my opinion that PCI Gen 4 was probably the most significant change in our recent fresh, refresh, and here's why. Uh, one of the advantages of having an in-house performance team is we get to input into their testing, and this includes testing non-shipping configurations. Uh, the gray and yellow lines we see here are the same hardware our recently released uh, P675F, P670F, uh, except for the NVMe cache drives, which are the same vendor, same class. The only difference is PCIe Gen 3 versus PCIe Gen 4. And this serves nicely to isolate as best we can the performance gains from the PCIe Gen 4 uh, bus, the backplane, what alone that is bringing us. So not only are PCI Gen 4 delivering an additional 38% in IOPS, but a 36% reduction in latency. VSAN is quite capable of delivering sub-millisecond latencies with small and medium block O, block IO, and at 1.1 millisecond for 32K IOs. If you like those numbers, check out back with us in October when we'll be adding the second gen Intel Optane to, uh, to our cache drive options. Um, these will get better. Uh, the green line, shows the additional performance that having RDMA for vSAN capable network cards and switches. Uh, RDMA has been around for a while, but it wasn't until 7.0 update 2 that it was leveraged by vSAN. RDMA offers several different benefits. Uh, in this case, we're seeing 20,000 additional IOPS per node, lower latencies, and uh, lower CPU utilization. The benefit of RDMA for vSAN is very workload dependent providing greatest gains for small block IO, but still delivering double digit IO, uh, so, sorry, still delivering double digit gains with large block IO and various protection types. Uh, or think of this in another way. What would you do with, uh, what would you save on hardware, software, licensing, et cetera, with one less node? Could that cover the cost of a network upgrade? Already made for vSAN is still uh, pretty new to the field. Um, only Mellanox having a certified driver for their CX4 and CX5 cards, but others are still in the works. Hey, David, can I ask about the slide before? Yes, you can. Hi, David. <laughs> Good to see you, Gina. Good to see you, too. Um, the gray line, how come it's got that weird thing at the end? What's up with that? This is where I defer to Nelson, um, one of our performance team members who's on the call. And uh, Nelson, can you clarify the little kickback there at the uh, on the gray line? I don't think we have Nelson. I thought he was on the call. Um, I'm going to have to get back to you on that, on that Gina. Um, I would see that as. Oh, a, I would say at, at the extreme levels, lots of things start to go bad, and sometimes they go they come back. So I mean, I, I understand that at at the final end of that, that there may be some challenges there. I, I, so I, this, these graphs, these the yellow and green. Um, are just an NVMe Optane cache, is SSD cache, is that what that is? Or is uh, it a so full the, NVMe configuration? It is or? not a full NVMe configuration. Um, it is an NVMe cache and uh, SAS SSDs for the capacity layer, three SAS. So the full configuration will be two disk groups, and each disk group considering uh, consisting of one NVMe cache drive and three uh, SAS SSDs for capacity. Whoa. Very nice. <laughs> yeah, those uh, performance numbers are nice. And considering that there's still headroom in terms of um, two additional disk groups that could be added in, we typically do most of our benchmarking around having only two disk groups because that covers most of our platforms. 
with the P series, you could have four disc groups. So that would push those numbers. Um, you really need to put commas further. on the bottom line here. Is that five million plus I ops? Uh, half a million. Half a million. Okay. So this uh, is a uh, four node cluster. Right. So any of those numbers divide them by four. And um, this is off of the uh, 16K, but on the 4K slide, uh, you would see us having that four by 155, so 630, 620. A thousand IOPS off of a four node cluster. Right, right. In short, um, VxRail, VSAN, HCI, uh, it's not lacking in the performance arena. So, RDMA uh, lets us push that additional, you know, 20,000 IOPS and um, side benefit would be lower CPU utilization, which, you know, either reduces the number of nodes in your cluster and your hardware and software and licensing costs or uh, just gives you more headroom for growth. Uh, this chart, again, is the aggregated throughput of a four node cluster. Uh, the aggregated throughput of a 10 gig network can be seen with that uh, blue line, the lower blue line, and then the upper blue line, uh, the aggregated throughput of a 25 gig network. Uh, so those are two, the two blue lines. Um, basically what the takeaway I want you to take from this slide is that um, 10 gig networking doesn't cut it for vSAN anymore. Uh, deploying today, you definitely need to be looking at 25 gig networking uh, with uh, a definite eye to maybe lagging those 25 gig networking as uh, vSAN pushes things even further. Um, again, this is on a random read throughput workload. So you're, maximi you're maximizing the read throughput but as you can see, we're quite well capable of saturating 10 gig and uh, at times with that extreme uh, right-hand column, uh, saturating 25 gig. So given the difference between uh, Ice Lake and the previous generation servers, would you say that it's PCIe Gen 4 specifically that is the differentiating factor or is it the availability of more PCIe lanes or more cores? G going back a few, so going back to that, uh, this one, uh, where we isolated with the gray line and the yellow line, where we changed only the cache drive from a PCIe Gen 3 cache drive to a PCIe Gen 4 cache drive. Um, yes, there is benefits coming from uh, the iSake processor, but I think the uh, PCIe Gen change from 3 to 4, uh, it's doubling in bandwidth, the additional uh, lanes. I think we go from 48 to 64 lanes for the entire box. Um, does is the biggest benefit. So yeah, um, random read throughputs. You are yeah, random read throughput. You 100% load. Uh, you definitely need to be. While this is not typical of a workload, it's a synthetic workload. It does show that uh, vSAN is quite capable of uh, pushing that throughput and uh, you know plan for 25 gig uh, for customers. You know existing uh, brownfield sites, um, 10 and 25 gig networking can be intermixed in terms of uh, you can plug a 10 gig NIC into a 25 gig car, a 25 gig switch so, or vice so versa. So David, are you seeing a lot of customers adopting the, the larger block sizes and stuff like that? Because I mean, it's it's where the larger block sizes inter intersect with the new hardware and, and uh, you know, new, new PCIe Gen 4 drives and stuff like that, where it starts to be a problem or, yeah. So one of the tools that our sales teams have access to is a tool called Live Optics. It's actually uh, open to anybody to use. Um, it is what they use for sizing up an environment in terms of what the expected workload or the workload that environment is uh, consuming. So looking at the existing customer's workload. The mean block size for that, and I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but they're in the 32K IO range. Okay. That, that was across several years and you know something like a million physical servers or a million customers um, so it's a large sample size that we can uh, comfortably say that yeah 30k is a reasonable uh, approximity all right so 7.0 looking back at 7.0 update one which came out uh, last year we can see that read performance for raid 5 and raid 6 is on a par with raid 1. Uh, RAID 1 is always going to lead in terms of write performance, no surprise there, but the gap has narrowed by 50%. Um, really, I bring this up as a question uh, for our customers and for those uh, of us out there in the, in the field is, um, is RAID 5 or 6 sufficient uh, for your workload? Does it have sufficient performance uh, to meet those SLAs and uh, customer demands? 
Um, what I did want to highlight was another change that uh, update one uh, brought to the table, and that was uh, the um, uh, splitting out of compression only. And this is probably my favorite slide of 2020 uh, because there's so much to talk about. So let me you know walk you through it before you, you know, bombard me with questions, right? Because I know they're coming. Uh, what we're looking here is the impact uh, of dedupe and compression can have on performance. The change in performance from 7.0 to 7.0. Update one. Looking at the green lines, we can see that upgrading to 7.0. Update one gains us 58% in peak IOPS for this workload. Not bad uh, for just staying up to date on your patching and so on. We also see significant gains for the same workload if using dedupe and compression, and that's those those two blue lines. Uh, in fact, you could enable dedupe and compression after upgrading and still have better performance than you did beforehand. I'm not suggesting that you dash out and <laughs> enable dedupe uh, because dedupe uh, comes with its own um, uh, caveats in terms of the uh, the failure domain that should be taken into consideration. But compression only doesn't have that failure domain. So, in a cluster, if a cluster's workload is suitable to data compression, the performance penalty is greatly reduced for that opportunistic gain. Just, just to be clear, this is the same hardware running the same software, and all you're doing, well, I mean, the software has changed from 7.0 to 7.0, you update one, but all you've done is enable or disable dedupe and compression. That's it. Uh, very nice. So, um, in, for, for VxRail, we have two pillars that we stand on. We stand on PowerEdge, we stand on VMware. And as, the, as they release updates, we add them to our product. Uh, sometimes it's uh, in hardware in terms of a new cache drive. Uh, sometimes it's in software and it comes out. And suddenly, you know, kind of like, oh, it does this. And it's uh, quite a lot of fun to look at the numbers. We're very fortunate at VxRail to have our own in-house performance team that constantly uh, runs these tests and takes a lot of input from us in terms of, hey, could we try it this way instead? Or could we poke at this new feature and see what impact it is having? And this is where we get you know, fun graphs like this, which very clearly uh, you know, pull out that, yes, you can, you're going to get a whole lot of performance by going from 7.0 to 7.0 update one. How do you want to spend that performance gain? And it can be just for future workloads that you anticipate down the line, or it can be, you know what, hey, I've got data that I know will compress wonderfully. I've avoided dedupe and compression because um, of the, the penalties of the um, of rebuilding a dedupe capacity drive. But when it's only uh, compression only, I don't have that penalty. And uh, hey, I'll get the gains. I'll spend my gains there and still have plenty. And this is, a, and this, and this is a database workload. This is not even just standard I/O read/write kind of stuff. It's it's uh, it's trying to emulate yep. database management stuff. Which is a 60-40 split in terms of reads versus writes. Yeah. We try and we, we keep our um, our benchmarks clear and you know as reflective of customer workloads and repeatability. Um, there's no honor in having a 100% read workload or 100% write workload. It doesn't. Um, it's not what customers tend to do for some reason. Um, so we need to have a graph that, that you know, shows what the customers do and what they're going to use, what they're going to buy. All right, thanks. And one last one. Um, last year, we uh, released our uh, two nodes to our eight, two nodes based on the AMD processors, uh, the E665 and the P675. And then uh, vSphere Update 2 came out and gave um, AMD a lot of love as well with changes to the SXI scheduler. You can see, and this is based off of the uh, Milan, no, Rome processors, and uh, Milan also came out um, and added some additional gains. But just comparing the Rome versus Rome, this is the uh, same system. Uh, just having that scheduler change in 7.0 update 2 gained uh, AMD-based systems uh, significant performance gains. Um, and that is it. A quick run through of um, some of the changes that have occurred in uh, VxRail from a software and a hardware perspective, uh, where the performance gains come from. These are all small incremental performance and changes that have occurred. Uh, but you know, when you combine them all together, um, 155,000 IOPS per node is uh, what you're getting. Uh, this is a link to a blog post uh, about our recent uh, portfolio refresh. Lots of links from it to other aspects of uh, 
the X-Rail, PowerEdge, and uh, VMware. And then for a whole host more of documentation uh, that we have that's publicly face viewable, uh, publicly accessible, and please follow the, those links. Uh, David, just a quick question. What's the performance impact if there was a drive failure uh, in that rebuild process? Good question. Um, so drive rebuilds don't go through the cache layer. Uh, the speed of a drive, and I'm just pulling up the deck in my head. Uh, the speed of a drive rebuild is going to, it's a many to many read write operation. Uh, so this is where having a fast drive and a fast network helps. Um, Kieran, I will work. Uh, if you shoot me an email, I will pull you the graph that I'm thinking of, and it does nicely show uh, the rebuild times for, and it is a rebuild time with a workload running in the background as well. I don't think it's a hugely heavy workload, but it's a you know production workload, and it'll give. I think it'll answer your question better. Okay, cool. Thank you. But, but yes, there is um, drive rebuilds aren't free. And there's always going to be impact on performance, but I think it really comes down to um, if your system is already at redline, you're going to have a problem. But as long as there's, you know, you're not running at 100%, there shouldn't be any noticeable um, impact. 